Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And today I have on a guest that's been, uh, he's been asked for quite a bit, but you know, the problem with being a movie star is it's hard to get a hold of you. I have Sam Scott, a Blue Ridge Muskie. Sir, this is a long time coming. Thank you so much for carving out some time in your busy schedule. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I know we've been trying to get this going for quite a long time now and uh, happy it probably worked. You are an absolutely busy man. And I know this story has been told a couple of times on different uh, media podcasts and magazines, but how did you get into this and really this rise? Because there's a ton of guides out there on different bodies of water. But the way you were able to carve out your niche on social media too is something you don't usually see a lot of guides doing. And so I really want to kind of get into that to begin with. Sure, sure. Um, Well, I guess we can start before I started guiding, um, by trade, uh, in college and and after college, I was a computer science major and I used to develop drone tech, uh, both for private companies and the military. And I thought that's what I was going to do for a living. It was really good pay and a nice cushy job. Uh, but I soon learned that sitting in an office all day wasn't for me. And I would just always wish I was out on the river. Uh, you know, that was my passion growing up and, uh, you know, fishing was always a passion, but the drone job was kind of a smart decision after college, you know. Anyways, I did that for a couple of years uh, and finally got tired of the office gig and uh, made, uh, made the jump to quit that job and, and start guiding. Um, so that was 2016 when I did that. And uh, that was right around the time a lot of the fishing YouTubers were you know, making it big and social media fishing was just kind of getting its, uh, traction. Um, and so that's what I did. I hit social media really hard. I, I did videos on YouTube, uh, nothing crazy, nothing fancy, just pushed a lot of content, a lot of fishing content, both videos and, uh, photos, uh, just to get my name out there and reputation, you know, cause I was known locally, uh, as you know, a great musky angler, great smallmouth angler, but outside of Virginia, no one really knew my name at the time. Um, you know, so that's what I did starting out is just, a got out there every day I could pretty much every day of the week, you know, 300 plus days a year, uh, and caught as many fish as I could with both myself and my buddies and clients and, uh, just pushed content really hard for like two or three years. And I think, you know, after two or three years, it, it took off. I was pretty much full time you know, 100 to 150 trips a year at that point. And at this point, I'm almost at 300 a year. So I, I stay pretty busy. Dear God, man. Good Lord. What? There's a bridge gap, though, between you flying drones for the government and you becoming an angler, like a full-time guided angler. How much did you fish prior to making this leap? Was this something that was just kind of like on the back burner? You were <laughs> obsessed with it? Like, how did that all intertwine into you making the leap? Yeah, so I, I fished growing up. Uh, I stayed on the river in high school. And you know, even before I could drive, mom would drop me off on a Friday after school and pick me up on a Saturday evening. I'd stay out there all night. Um, so it was, it's always been a passion. I've stayed on the river since I was a kid, uh, camping, fishing, hanging out with friends. Uh, <clears throat> but when I went off to college and started my career in the UAS industry, you know, I'd, I became like a weekend warrior, you know, and sometimes I'd call the boss in sick. So I go out fishing, uh, but it was just, you know, the passion just was getting in the way of work. You know, I just, I would, that's all I could think about was getting out there fishing, taking my buddies out, just enjoying the river, not just for the musky fishing, just being on the river itself is, you know, I call it medicine. You know, it's my church. Um, but yeah, it, it was getting in the way of work. I, I was letting it get in the way of work pretty much. And so, uh, in 2016, I, I just decided to leave the office gig and, and uh, start the guide service. And I think that there was a period of time, maybe like eight eight months to a year where I did both for a while. You know, I was doing like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, guided musky trips and then four days in the office. And I did that for about a year, but uh, quit and went full-time pretty quickly after that. 
That's brutal. That's really hard to make that kind of jump. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, definitely a lot of work, you know, um, starting out because I was trying to put everything I could into the guide service, uh, everything I could, I was, you know, working four days in the office. And then after the office, I'd get home and edit video or I'd go to the <laughs> river, <laughs> go to the river for a couple hours after work and then edit video. But the whole YouTube thing was a lot of work and I have kind of stopped doing that since, uh, mainly cause I don't have the time for it, but. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize just how much work it takes to to put content out like that. And the guys that are still doing it, like today's angler and Mike Keys and you know all the burning eights, all those musky guys that still put that video content out, man, I get my hats off to them because I know how much work it is. When did this segue from? I, I guess I, I like to call it when you first start a business, your startup phase, and it goes from a startup to where you are now. When did you and your mindset, it clicked and there's that transition between like, I think I'm going to do this and to, oh shit, I made it type of deal or, or, or you feel better off. Right. Well, I think initially, like I was saying, like about a year, the first year I was kind of doing both, uh, still had a salaried position and, uh, I was doing like the weekend thing, Friday, Saturday, Sundays, I was taking clients out. Um, and at that point, I kind of just regarded it as my side hustle. You know, it was funding my addiction for musky. You know, so I'd fish the weekend with clients, make a couple bucks, buy more lures, buy more rods, you know, and uh, put gas in the boat pretty much. Um, so at that point, it was more of a side hustle than it was a career path, even though I, I definitely wanted it to be a career path. Mm -hmm. I knew for it to be a, a, an actual career that I could support my family on, I would have to do it full time and put everything I had into it. I couldn't be splitting sides, you know, splitting time with, uh, with this, uh, job that I had. So I'd say, uh, you know, after a year or two of being full time, putting everything I had in, into the, the guide service, uh, it paid dividends. You know, I was, I was out there at least five, six days a week, pretty much throughout the season. And our season is eight months long here. So, uh, nine months sometimes. I, I ask this to to all my guides when they first come on the show, and, and this is a hundred percent for you. When you're guiding five, six, seven days a week, three hundred days, as you put it earlier, how do you keep your body and mind in shape to do that? Because that is like it's a brutal job physically and immensely demanding. Right, right. It definitely is. Uh, that's a good question. Um, as far as my mind goes, I think that's an easy part for me. I like meeting the clients. I love talking and, uh, you know, just talking shit on the boat with them and sharing stories. And, uh, I always tell people that's the best part of my job is the people I meet and the fellowship out on the boat. You know, the fish is just a bonus. Um, but I, I have met some really awesome people and, uh, and that's gotta be the best part of this job is just the people you meet and, uh, and what you learn about, you know? Uh, as, as far as the body goes, yeah, you're, you're not getting a whole lot of sleep. You know, I'm, I usually start my day at four, four thirty is when my alarm goes off and I leave the house around five 30, uh, get to the river around six, you know, six fifteen, six thirty, something like that. And, and we usually start our trips around sunrise. Um, not so much in the middle of winter cause it's too cold, but most of the year we start around sunrise and we fish eight to 10 hours, you know? And so then I'm, back home at five or six, got to clean everything up, you know, get all the tackle sorted and ready for the next day. Sometimes I'm changing, transitioning from gear fisherman to fly fisherman. And so everything's got to be torn out of the boat. Fly gear has got to be put back in, got to rearrange everything. Uh, and so usually by the time I get home, there's an hour at least of just getting stuff ready for the next day. So by the time I walk in the house, ready to eat dinner with my wife, you know, sometimes it's six thirty, seven 7 o'clock, sometimes later. Um, you know, and then of course the phone never shuts up. So by the time I get home, I've got to answer emails and text messages from potential clients that want to book trips, you know, answer questions and, and talk to people about, you know, what their trip is going to look like and, uh, and how to book and all that. Um, so really the day never stops. Even if I have a day off, like for instance, today I had my first day off in 15 days. Uh, Jesus, man. But, uh, I had a ton of stuff I had to get done. The truck had to be serviced. I had to get new tires on the truck. You know, a bunch of tackle had to be worked on. Reels had to be relined. Like it, it was still, a, I still worked, you know, even though I was off the river, I was still working. And, and of course on the phone, constantly talking to people, that's that part never ends. Um, 
and I've done some things uh, here in the last year or two to kind of help with the time management on the phone. I got a new booking service and that's cut out a ton of time, uh, a, a ton of the conversation that I have to take, you know, to inform people and, and, and educate people about the trip and lodging, and all the details. Um, so that's helped out quite a bit. But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a full-time job, man. I always, I always laugh about telling people I left an eight to five salary job so I could work 24 hours a day. <laughs> I think that's so important, though, to bring to light because we always want to glorify guiding or glorify being in the outdoor industry. But you have to understand that you need to give this context to potential customers that, yeah, it's like this is why the tip is so important. This is why, you know, probably don't just be so pissy all the time because you always have those people. And it's good to give them the perspective, like how much work y'all put into this on a day to day basis to make this happen. And but absolutely, I bet that rock proof boat though that you just upgraded to makes it life a little bit easier, too. Oh, dude, you have no idea, man. Best, best boat I've ever run. It's, it's a Cadillac out there. When did you pull the trigger on that? Um, so I bought this one back in April. I just randomly had a client out last December. Um, Brian Mullaney. He's, uh, he used to guide for Joe Raymond and, uh, he got into tournament fishing tournament bass fishing and so he had all these boats he bought this jet boat so he could do you know guided smallmouth trips on the susquehanna and he bought it and didn't really use it uh, but we were on my stealth craft jet boat back in december and um talking about it and it was a great boat i loved it and i just kind of offhand mentioned i wish i had a little more room and a little more horsepower and he was like well i got a rock proof i'd sell you and uh, these people don't come off these things very easily, especially the model that I've got. They're sought after and uh, they're hard to find. Um, and so I didn't really think he was serious. You know, I thought maybe he was just talking shit with me. But a month later, I texted him. I was like, hey, man, you serious? You, you really want to come off that boat? And he's like, yeah, man, come get it. So I drove up to Maryland, picked the boat up, brought it back down here and worked out of it for a week. He let me take it and, and check it out for a week. So I did trips, ran out of it, worked out of it for a week to see if that's what I wanted. Oh, man, after the third or fourth day, I called him. I was like, all right, dude, I'm sending you a check. Like, <laughs> I don't need no more time. This boat is amazing. Uh, and I've been in a couple before that. You know, I'd had buddies and you know other guides that ran them. And they're awesome boats. But to work out of one for a couple days, you know, it was just so much more room uh, and just power, you know, to get up on plane and go places and not have to worry about hitting a rock in the, in the low water. Um, it's, it's a pretty sweet rig for, for what I do. How does that affect when you, when you're looking at the James river and, and, and the amount of area that you're going to be trying to, to navigate, to find your key areas, how much does that affect it when you're going from a drift style boat to a crotch rocket basically for lack of a better term right well it's it's definitely more efficient right so if you've only got eight hours in a day to catch musky and you're fishing for one or two bites a day um you really want to capitalize on every single minute you can uh and it's kind of a double-edged sword you know i'll go over both the, the benefits and uh and, and and the negative side of jet boats and i think there's there's benefits to the drift boats too um, you know, I rode a drift boat for, you know, the first four or five years of guiding and, uh, and loved it and did very well with it. Um, but there's definitely an efficiency factor with, with a jet boat, right? So you're fishing the prime spots and then a minute later you're in the next prime spot. You know, you don't have to row through 30 minutes of dead water to get to the next prime spot. Um, and so your clients are fishing more. They got rods in their hands. They're casting more throughout the day instead of sitting and waiting to get to the next spot. Uh, and that's important, you know, because every single cast matters. You know, if, if you can gain an extra 10% of the day casting, that's going to add up to fish in the boat um, with musky fishing. It's, I always break it down as like an efficiency game. You know, the, the most good cast you can make to good water, you know, with good baits in front of fish, more fish you're going to catch. Um, so having a, a fast jet boat that can get from point A to point B quickly um, and also get to places that other jet boats can't get to, uh, you know, because this thing is a tank. You can rock crawl with it. You can go right over the ledges, you know, hit rocks. Doesn't matter. Keep going. Whereas, you know, bare metal boats or fiberglass boats can't do that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it definitely helps. I would definitely say the rock group definitely helps put more fish in the boat. 
But on the other hand, when you're rowing a boat, a raft or a drift boat, you're kind of forced to fish other areas of the river that mm -hmm. you would overlook. You would run right by in the jet boat. And if you're not familiar with the river and you don't know it to, to the level, you know, after fishing it a whole lifetime, uh, sometimes doing a drift and fishing everything is going to be yeah. to your advantage because you're learning the river. You're finding where all the fish are. You know, you're fishing areas that the jet boat guys fly right past. So sometimes, you know, the guy in a raft will pick up an extra fish somewhere you would never think, you know, must be laying. And that's just because they're one speed, nice and slow all day long. And, and clients are casting through the riffles and, and places where you no, normally wouldn't musky fish, you know, in the winter or something. Uh, so there's, you know, there's that. That's definitely an advantage. Uh, you know, the drift boat's quieter. It's more peaceful. You know, some of the fly guys, some of the more traditional clients and the fly fishing guys prefer that style of, of guided trip. And. And so I've always maintained uh, that option for them. I've got another guide that, that rows a raft. And um, if that's what the customer wants to do, we've got that available for them. Um, but most most customers would prefer to be in, in the jet boat. And a lot, of them, a lot of them say, man, the ride was worth the price of admission. <laughs> it, I'm glad you, you mentioned the compare contrasting because I remember when I had Nolan Miner on the show, I think it was the first time, and he told me when he made his transition to the kayak and he was like, man, I didn't realize how many fish you left in an area when you have a 250 on the back. And I was right. talking to uh, uh, SB Fishing uh, earlier today because he's fishing a tournament in the Potomac. It's the same thing. It's like you get this itch because you got the big engine. I, I got to run. It's stupid not to. But when you're forced right. to fish, you're like, shit, there's more here than, than I thought. And I, I want to kind of yeah. label this to you as a guy that fishes the James. How much does it actually hurt when you have so much knowledge? Does it actually, do you rediscover new places when you're forced to actually fish through an area versus like, this is the juice. I hit that. We got to move. Yeah. So I think that was, uh, that's definitely been a part of my progression as both an angler and a guide. You know, every year I learn something new. Uh, I try new tactics. Uh, I fish new water. Um, and I've, I've kind of been careful not to let myself get stuck fishing the same places with the same baits, you know, what I know that works. Um, at least, at least once a day, I always try to do something new, you know, whether that's pull a bait out of the box that I wouldn't normally pull out that time of year, or uh, maybe go try an area that I blow past all the time. Um, or maybe just try a completely new tactic. And, and that's the awesome thing about being a guide is you get anglers from all over the country you know a lot of them have musky fished before and, and they bring skills and tactics from their home waters whether that be wisconsin or michigan or new york mm. or north carolina west virginia you know they're musky everywhere and these guys bring tactics back to me to show me you know this is what i do at home let's see if it works here and i love that i never tell them oh that's not going to work here i never you know, boo-hoo anything because I've seen it happen time and time again where I'm surprised by a tactic that works that I would never have thought of. And so over the years of seeing all these new, you know, tactics and learning from people and trying new things myself, uh, you know, you just start to build up this this arsenal of, of knowledge and skills and, and different tactics and uh, techniques and whatnot. And um, yeah, it, it over, you know, the course of a, a couple of years, you can start stacking up some uh, some great ways to catch these fish. Are, are Minnesota, Wisconsin guys is that as different as as California guys in bass fishing bringing techniques over east? Is it is it that different of a style? It is and it isn't. So, um, like I'll give I'll give you an example. I had Pete I had Pete Mania out, Pete Mania and Lee Talkin out uh, a couple of years back uh, on two separate occasions, but um course they brought all their tools and baits with them you know that they fish rivers in in the north woods wisconsin minnesota um and then i brought some baits you know that i have been having success that week on and you know i'd say hey you know this is what we've been catching fish on you know you guys can throw whatever you'd like we can fish however you like but you know here's here's a good start if you want to see what we've been having success on in the last couple of days and they take a look at the baits like what is that I've never seen that before you know like a pull bait oh, or a cool. sucker bait you know something that kind of grew up was created and grew up in this area. Um, hmm. you know, and, uh, they just didn't, they, they'd never seen it before. And as soon as we started throwing it and it was moving fish, it was like, wow, that's, that's insane that that works, you know, so well down here. Whereas, you know, some of the tactics and, and baits that 
would work really well in the rivers up there might not work here. A good example is the Medusa. Uh, you know, a lot of guys fish the Medusa up north and have great success, like really good success. Everyone loves a Medusa up north, especially in the big lakes. Uh, and for whatever reason down here, they just not that great. They do catch fish. They will catch fish here and there, but they're not that amazing bait that they are up north that everyone throws. Suix is another one, right? The old uh, tried and true Suix lure from way back in the day. You know, everyone still fishes that thing up north. And that thing's, you know, from, uh, I might be getting this wrong, but I know it's like the 60s probably when that, when that bait came out. It's an old bait. It's very simple and it works. But you bring that thing down here and it just doesn't produce like it does up there. Um, you know, our, our fish are just keyed into a different a different style of uh, rivers. And, you know, our, our suckers down here are a little bit different, you know, where they might have more shad up there in their rivers. You know, we have primarily hog suckers down here and red breast sunfish. Uh, so our fish are just doing different things, I think, you know, and, uh, it's cool to compare and contrast our tactics and how they differ, you, especially when I have like a guide from up north or you know, a lifetime angler like Pete Mania that's been doing it for twice as long as I've been alive almost, you know, like dude's an absolute legend. And man, I soaked up everything I could like a sponge when I had him out. But uh, yeah, you just learn things over the years and, and you just figure out what works and what doesn't. And uh and I always try to keep an open mind, you know, and try to learn new new things every year. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. So you, you perked up two things. Um, you talked about the, the sunfish and you also talked about the suckers and... Uh, you know, this past week I, I was nominated onto the black bass advisory board for Maryland. So one of the topics that came up in our meeting was the flathead situation on the upper Potomac. Um, so yeah, we're going to get right into that real quick. Um, sure. how, how has the bait been on the James with the flathead? I, I've had a couple of guides on from the James. I've had a couple of anglers on that fish there and they're like, it's, this could become a worse problem. Is that taking it out of context or is it something that is present that's a problem oh it's it's definitely an issue down here um i would say in most of the river most of the james river is not a big issue right now i mean it's they're definitely voracious predators and they have to they have to feed on a lot of biomass especially those big ones it, it takes a lot of biomass to sustain a, a flathead population and when they run out of brim and and sunfish they're going to eat smallmouth and whatever else they can get their mouths on. Uh, but one thing I'll bring up uh, about that topic is several years ago, I think it was 2019, maybe, maybe 2018, I worked on a study with the state biologist. It was a, a fairly big undertaking that we did. It was called a depletion sampling. Mm -hmm. And we did it in Lynchburg, Virginia on the James River, right? So in Lynchburg, we have a dam that prevents yep. any uh, movement upstream. There's no bridge or, you know, no way for the fish to get upstream over that dam. It's a, a high, high head dam. Well, depletion sampling takes, we try to shock up every single fish in a given stretch. And in this case, we did a quarter mile down from the dam. So, uh, pretty much all the way up to the dam, we would shock. And we had like, I think it was 14 shock boats lined up shoulder to shoulder all the way across the river. And we would just slowly work up, shocking everything up. And we would net the muskies, the smallmouth, the flatheads, the channel cats, but also the minnows, every minnow species we could find, the sunfish, you know, the eels, it, everything that turned its belly up, we would net, put in the live well, and then it would go, we'd have another jet boat ferrying uh, our, our contents of the live well in the boats to the banks so that we could continue to shock and continue to work our line up to this dam. And on the bank, we had like 30 or 40 biologists with these giant pool size holding tanks with uh, water circulating in them. And they would go through each and every fish that we shot, measure it, log it, and then release it down below a riffle so that we weren't shocking up the same fish again. And it was an all day undertaking. A lot of people there. I mean, probably close to, I'd say between 75 and 100 people were at that event. 
Holy uh, shit. And I was fortunate. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to get involved in this. And I, I actually filmed it as well. That video is on my YouTube channel. If anyone listening wants to check that out. Uh, but getting to the point here, what we learned from that event was we found a lot of flathead catfish in the 20 to 30 pound range. Uh, and also from compared to the last depletion sampling and the last uh, fall samplings that these guys had done in Lynchburg, we saw a decrease in smallmouth bass. It wasn't a huge decrease, but it was no, definitely noticeable decrease. Mm-hmm. And so what was going on there, uh, these, these guys were hosting uh, flathead tournaments or catfish tournaments uh, every Friday or Saturday night for the whole summer. And so anglers would fish from all around. Uh, I don't know if it was the entire river they could fish or maybe statewide. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, But the weigh-in was in Lynchburg. And so they'd bring all these catfish from all around that they caught throughout the night. And they'd weigh them in Lynchburg and then let them go in Lynchburg. Jesus. And so all those giant catfish these guys were culling through the tournament and only keeping the big ones were getting released in Lynchburg. Uh and yeah, they, they put a beating on the small out there. Um, you know, that in, com- in combination with more fishing pressure, you know, that place isn't what it used to be five years ago. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's no secret that flatheads do eat smallmouth. I, you know, I, I saw a photo recently, Joe Raymond put up of, uh, like a 20 inch or half digested. He pulled mm-hmm. out of the gullet of a giant flathead, 20 inch smallmouth. Like, uh, you know, like I said, it takes a lot of biomass to feed those guys. Same thing as a muskie. You know, muskie is the same way. It takes a lot of biomass. You know? So you got to have a healthy bait fish population to sustain a population of muskie like we have here. Does the increase in the, the flathead biomass affect the behavior of muskie at all? I, we know, and especially I've had Jeff Little on the show. I've had some biologists up in my area talk about how the old wintering holes for smallmouth. Now the smallmouth are wintering a little bit shallower now because, because of the flathead. I mean, how does that affect the apex predator of the river and the muskie? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if I could really speak on that. So on the upper James here, uh, which is the river I primarily fish, I also fish the new river quite a bit, but I live closer to the James. So I end up on that river more often. Um, but on the upper James, the flathead population is pretty sparse. You have to get further down, like, uh, towards the dams. We've got a lot of dams down towards Lynchburg, big Island area. And that's usually where the, the larger flathead populations are. Um, and there's also great smallmouth fishing in those areas too. So um, I don't know that I could say that it's affected the uh, the smallmouth in our area. I haven't worked with the state on any of those studies. I haven't really talked to them about that. Uh, it's definitely something I know they're keeping an eye on, especially after that depletion sampling. Um, you know, I think um, they they always do a different area for the depletion sampling. So we you know we could ask them what the depletion for 2020 and 2021 looked like, you know, as far as the flathead versus smallmouth populations. Uh, but as far as a lot of the areas on the upper James further up in the mountains, uh, the flatheads are, are fairly thin in population. They're there. They're that they're definitely there. And we occasionally catch them on muscular lures. We'll catch 40 pounders on muscular lures. Um, but they're not as, as thick, as dense in population as they are further down in the dam areas where, you know, that water pools up and it's really deep. Uh, and then you go to even further down, like towards, uh, towards Richmond. And that's, that's really where they're at. You know, that's where guys mm-hmm. are catching giant, giant fish and you know they're catching them on swim baits in the spring. And I mean, it's a big deal down there. The, the catfish fishing gets way better the further down you go. So last question, on the flathead, and I've probably asked every single person, this every biologist. So no pressure here. Just want anecdotal evidence from you too. Why is it the new river is actually the home range of the flathead? And that is the one area where you have homeostasis between the smallmouth, the muskie, and the flathead, basically on the East Coast. Every other river, there's there everything's in, out, of, out of whack, out of balance. In your opinion, why is it the new river, it has this homeostasis based on what the biologists state, but no other place can do that? What What is missing everywhere else that that place has? That's a good question. Um, the first thing that jumps to my mind with that is the size of the new river. Uh, so it's a much larger river than the James or, you know, the upper Potomac. Um, 
And so maybe that has something to do with it, you know, allowing habitats to separate between these fish, you know, allowing more separation. You know, the flathead has a specific habitat that they like to be in. The muskie has a very specific habitat that they like to be in seasonally, too, as well as the smallmouth. So smallmouth have a seasonal habitat for the summer and a seasonal habitat for the winter. Um, so maybe being that the river is just a little bit bigger and has more uh, variation in habitat than the James River does uh, or the Upper Potomac does, uh, maybe that has something to do with it. I'm not sure. That's, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know enough about flathead fishing to, to really properly answer that. I, I'll admit I'm not really a, f- a flathead guru. <laughs> no, no, no. But but you, and this is what I tell every single, I ask every guy this question because like you guys are on the water more than some biologists. So you see stuff. So anecdotally, yeah. you might have a thought that no one else has, has you know even considered. And I, I've always thought that because I've asked Odenkirk. I've asked the guy from, I, I have, this episode hasn't dropped out yet, but I had the guy from Clemson that actually does the, the Alabama bass thing. He doesn't understand it. So no one has a great idea of why that place works and nowhere else. You know, I grew up on the Shenandoah. I moved to the upper Potomac and right now our bluegill population is gone. There's no bluegill left because of the flathead and the flathead anglers and the Shenandoah now has it too. And so it's really weird how these rivers, and it seems like the James are being taken over with this. But what's funny is when I was growing up, people bitched about the muskie being the issue. Always yeah, bitched yeah. about that, especially the and small that took years. Culture. That took years to try to uh, change the the subject on that. Yeah, change change people the p- public opinion on that, and we're still working on that. But, um, yeah, I definitely understand that. And one one thing I bring up on that topic is, uh, some of like I said, the 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 flatheads on the upper stretches of the James and the mountains are sparse, right? So you kind of run into areas where you know there's flatheads, and other areas where you've never seen one in your life. Um, you know, and there's one, one place in particular that happens to have some really big flathead I've caught just fishing for muskie, you know, we're catching 40 pounders there uh, pretty much every fall, just fishing for muskie. They're in there, but that same area, that half mile or three quarter mile stretch of river also happens to be, you know, the best freaking spot for smallmouth that I know of for miles, you know, the, hmm. the big, the really big smallmouth just freaking stack up there um and you know so it must they must be coexisting somewhat well for yeah. for me to be finding the biggest smallmouth in the river and the biggest flathead in the river and also a heck of a lot of musky in the same three-quarter to you know a mile stretch of river um and uh that that goes to show that you know they are somewhat coexisting and also you, you mentioned your sunfish populations were decreasing uh well, this year, myself and a lot of local anglers and other guides have noticed that our sunfish populations are bounding back. We've seen a ton of wow. sunfish, uh, you know, that we didn't see in the last two or three years, as well as um, uh, a couple other species, a couple other bait species. Um, the, what, uh, the, uh, the small. Uh, Bull, not not bullhead uh what are these other small catfish species oh um, oh oh god damn it i know what you're talking about hellbenders not hellbenders um no 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 it's a, it's a small catfish species i know exactly what you're ta- yeah i know what you're talking about shit that's, that's gonna keep me up at night <laughs> it's right there on the tip but anyways those those haven't been seen in a long time i haven't seen them in a long time and guys are catching them in freaking sane nets this year like they're they're everywhere uh, and so there's several species this year that I've seen bound back, as well as our smallmouth. So I don't know if you heard about the, the smallmouth population in the James River. The DWR has put newsletters out about it. They've been talking about it. They're, they have admitted that the, the numbers of smallmouth took took a dive, took a nose dive, uh, you know, like three or four years ago, maybe even earlier than that, but very noticeable in the last three or four years. Um, so this year. There's a noticeable increase in young fish swimming around. Um, we were having an issue for a while there where they were spawning, but our our fingerlings weren't getting to adolescent stage. They weren't they weren't surviving to a, to a larger size fish. Something was happening to them. Couldn't quite figure it out. You know, we we found a lot of floaters. We'd send them out to the labs, you know, and uh, and get testing for bacteria infections and and, and parasites and, and stuff like that, viral infections. We couldn't figure out what was going on with these fish where they were dying. They weren't 
they weren't all growing uh, past that small fingerling stage. Um, whereas this year, we have seen a ton, ton, ton more small fish, and our catch numbers are also starting to increase. You know, whereas you know, full day fishing with two clients last summer, we would be like 30 to 40 fish for a day. Now we're at 55, 60, 65 fish a day uh, consistently. So that's good to see. And, and hopefully that trend continues for the smallmouth. Um, but yeah, the numbers of smallmouth bass definitely have been down for the last couple of years. So it's good to see them coming back. Guys, you know, with, with all the all the DWR and river keepers we've had on the show this year alone, um, another thing is probably just the, the high water events that we had a couple of years ago where they stacked back to back because we yeah. had a shitty thing, at least on the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac, which I'm really keyed into, where you're having high water events just when the spawn's supposed to happen. And it just, yes. it's a perfect storm of suck. Right, right. And that's, that's what we attributed it to at first. I was like two or three years straight of crap spawns. Uh, and, you know, so that's what we attributed it to at first, but then we started noticing the fingerlings weren't making it past a certain stage. Uh, and we were finding like last summer and the summer before we were finding a lot of dead fingerlings, like in the two to three inch range, really small, you know, young of the years, we call them. Um, so something was going on, you know, with that. I don't know whether, you know, it, it could have been something in the water. You know, maybe one of the farms upstream was, was fertilizing their field with something they shouldn't have in runoff you never know you mean we've got paper mills and all sorts of stuff you never know what could get into the river one year around the spawn that just taints the the the, uh the fry um but it was definitely there was definitely something going on i don't think they ever figured it out uh maybe they did but the last i talked with them which was a month and a half ago about this specific uh this specific thing they hadn't quite figured that out but um, it, it does look like it's coming back how has the sub, how has the SAV been on the river this past year since we've had had a lot of rain? Have you had a lot of grass? Yes, we had more grass this year than I've ever seen in this river. Hmm. Um, which it's uh, it's kind of annoying to fish around, and I don't know whether it's good or bad for the river. But we're also seeing the paper mill in Covington uh, on the Jackson is releasing way more tannins into the water that brown stuff that turns your water you know brownish blackish tea color interesting they've been releasing a ton in the last couple of years and so like the first 20 or 30 miles of the upper james some days it's black as molasses you can't even fish it man i had a i did a video last year i went out there and scooped water up in my hand and it looked like like coffee in my hand like just a puddle of water in your hand it was black as could be you know, in, in the eddy areas where it laps up on the grass and the bank, it was like tar on the grass blades. It was nasty, man. And let me tell you, when it got that bad, you could forget China musky fish. They they were not having it. Although it wasn't killing the fish, we didn't find, you know, belly up fish. It was definitely doing something to them. They weren't feeding, you know, I don't I don't blame them. They had all that crap in their gills. I'm sure it's, it suffocated some of the oxygen out of the water. Uh, but they're doing something up there, releasing more tannins. I've talked with the DEQ about it, the DWR. Have you talked to uh, Rob Campbell, just a, the a Waterkeeper Alliance up there in Lynchburg, about the whole thing going on with the Jackson and the paper mill? I sent him a message at one point. I don't think I ever heard back. I have. I tried to contact JRA, the James River Association, about it. Didn't hear back from them. Um, but yeah, it's definitely. It'd be great to get them involved. They have a lot more pull and resources, and you know. I, there's only so much I can do. And, and when I made some noise about it this past winter, I, I definitely heard some backlash from that. You know, the guys from the plant weren't happy that I was making noise about it. And, you know, they, they never it are. is what it is. They, no. they never are. 
here's a great little segue now. I've been seeing you in the woods and water and, and, and the James River for God knows how long when it comes to muskie fishing. But when you look at, at the James and the New, it's just they're twin sisters. And, and I always thought, and I could be mistaken, it was always the, the New River is what kicked off the muskie craze in Virginia. But then the James somehow swept in like the hotter sister and just took all the limelight. When did the James really become the symbol of muskie fishing in Virginia? Um, I don't know that it is. Honestly, the, the New River is, in my opinion, just as good as the James um and, and in some cases better than the james because it can sustain a higher flow so if we get a ton of rain uh the new river handles that better than the james does and so i don't know that the, the james necessarily is the better river it's the river that i fish primarily uh and so that might have something to do with it you know hmm. you know probably 70 75 to 80 percent of my trips are on the james uh, and so that might have something to do with it but i wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't say the James is the star of the show when it comes to the Virginia rivers to fish. In fact, the Shenandoah is coming up very quickly behind us. That river, yeah. keep your eye on, man, because the, the muskie population and the muskie fishing out there is getting better every year. Bigger fish, more numbers every year. Every year I see it, it gets better and better. It, it, it's a, I have a guy, well, I'm recording next week with him talking specifically about that, but huge shout out to Halliker too and all the work that they've done because that's, it, it's coming, it's it's coming. And so is the walleye population as well. Yeah, Jason has put a ton of, of effort into the the Shenandoah. And, you know, as well as our Muskies Inc. chapter, we, uh, all the money that we raise uh, from like the fingerling fling tournaments and our chapter and even uh, my tackle shop, uh, James River Outfitter raises money every year for this, but we uh, we raise money to feed our fingerling muskies to grow them to a larger size before stocking. And like 90% of those fingerlings get stocked in the Shenandoah. You know, a couple of them go to a, a couple of lakes in the area, but most of them go to the Shenandoah. And so, you know, Halliker has put a ton of effort into it, but also our, our chapter and, and a lot of anglers around the state that don't even fish the Shenandoah. We've just been putting a lot into it to try to get that river you know, up to par with the James and the new, you know, that's good for me. Even if I don't fish the Shenandoah on the regular, that's good for me because it spreads the pressure out. Everyone's got another place they can go fish. I was just talking with a guy yesterday about this. We, we would love to have a good musky lake in Virginia right now. We don't, we've got a couple very small, more like ponds than lakes. Um, but like West Virginia has got tons of awesome musky lakes and you go anywhere north of West Virginia and musky lakes are everywhere. Um, and I really wish the state would put some resources into stocking in a, in a larger lake to, to spread the pressure out. That way, not everyone's trying to go to the James River. Not everyone's trying to go to the New River. You know, we've got a little variety. When the rivers blow out, we've got a lake we can fish or, you know, when the when the lake's too hot, we still have a river we can hit, you know. So having just having a little variety and, and spreading the pressure out, because uh, yeah, it's it's worked well for other states, West Virginia in particular. You know, we've got a very similar climate and ecosystem to West Virginia, uh, and Stonewall Jackson, uh, Stone Cold, Burnsville, they've done very well with their musky populations up there. Are you thinking like a Claytor Lake or a Lake Moomaw then, something like that? I think Muma would be the perfect lake and so do a lot of the other uh, anglers in Virginia. Uh, you know, and there's, there's quite a few good candidates that would work well for it. The problem is Muma is a trout lake. Uh, and yeah. you know, you're going to piss off a lot of trout guys by putting an apex predator that would eat trout into that lake. Um, and so it's like, it's a political thing when it comes to doing that, you know, the, the, the biologist can write up a plan, a proposal, I should say, and be like, hey, you know, this would work very well if we put this species in here. But when it comes down to it, they're going to talk with, you know, like the, the, the trout chapters and trout alliances and, and, you know, different groups in the area and, you know, Lake Muma and residents around. And, and it's going to get boohooed pretty quick about putting muscalonge in a trout lake. Uh, but I think Muma will be a good, uh, a good, uh, example, I think Smith Mountain, because it already has muskie in it, it's a huge lake. The problem with that, it, it, I think they could, uh, I think it could sustain it well, and they, they would probably get along pretty well with, with the striped bass populations that are there. Um, <clears throat> but because it's so, such a huge lake, it would take a lot of stocking to get that lake to fishable populations. 
Uh, and that's a lot of money that they'd have to allocate for that. And also you've got, you know, Smith Mountain is a striper lake and a huge largemouth bass tournament lake. So now you've got to contend with those guys, you know, and, and they're not going to want another predator eating the same bait as what their stripers and their, and their largemouth are eating. Cause you know, now there's competition for their bass. They're not going to get as big. So it's very political trying to introduce a muskie into any body water that it's not already in. I mean, it's political just now that I'm seeing more how the sausage is made. Um, it's political to get anything done. I mean, just to even get the F1 program off the ground where it wasn't private and it's actually taken over by the state, that took a huge push to even get that done. So, And, and I get it because it, it, money's involved. Everyone has to make sure their constituents are. But you know what you've done and Halleker have done have been a, a miracle because if you look at what the Shenandoah is turning into, what the James is and the new. And, and people have asked like, why, why does the James get pounded? And, I, and I've said with the other guys that I've had on the show, it's because of its location. It's perfect. The new river is Jurassic park. It's on the ass end of the world. No one wants to drive there generally speaking, but if you live in Richmond, you're a lawyer that owns a practice. It's not that hard to go to the James new. Eh, it's a little bit more of a drive. And I think that's why a place just is so much in the line limelight. That's very true. You know, that that's very true. Uh, and there's there's a, uh, but the, the, on the other hand, you've got the New River from the border of North Carolina through Virginia into West Virginia, and it all has muskies. So there's 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 a lot more range in the New, and it's spread out more, and the river's bigger. Uh, so and, and the fishing is just as good as the James. A lot of you know a lot of people don't realize that, but the, the fishing in the New River is just as good. Uh, you know it you might have to take a little more time to learn it, you know, cause it's more water that you're covering and figuring out. Um, but the fish get just as big and there's just as many of them. How do you pick then for your, for your guide, for your guided trips? I mean, I'm assuming there's the gas situation too. Drunk from yeah, it's just a distance things. thing. I'm yeah. where I live now. I'm 15 minutes from the James river, you know, okay. and it's, it's an hour, almost an hour, 45 minutes to get to the, the closest part of the new river to me. Uh, which would be like Radford area. Um, so I do fish the new in the winter quite a bit, mainly because the James will blow out uh, and the new won't, you know, when we have a rainstorm or snow melt or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to want to go an hour away and add two hours to your day when you've got a 15 minute ride you know, to, to several sections of the upper games. Sam, you know, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I know you're a super busy man. Um, you know, please let, let everyone know where they can find you. You might have some trips still left uh, this year or next year that people could book with you. How, how do they do that? Yeah. So I, I do have a couple of trips left, uh, starting next year, January, February, March for, the, for our trophy season in muskies. And I also have another guy that I mentioned, Jamie does raft trips and we've got lots of availability with him in the raft all season long. Uh, but you can find me on social media. I'm on all that Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, if you'd like to book a trip, go to anycreek.com and you can find me there. Uh, my calendar is live there. You can find all the dates that are open. Uh, we can support up to six people. If you have a big group or a small group, or just want to come by yourself. Guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, go check him out on the social media again. And the other thing is, if you don't book a guide trip with him, try to donate to his program or donate to the, to the musky anglers, um, to really help the state to be able to push this. Because if it wasn't for the backing of, of just private individuals, I don't think the musky fishing would be where it is today on all of our river systems. So huge shout out to you guys for all the work that you did. Uh, like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.